Welcome listeners to another My Mind Mashups Deep Dive, where we unravel mysteries, spark curiosity, and make sense of complex ideas together. Today, we're jumping into a claim that, well, it pretty much lit up the internet. You probably saw it on your feed. For the first time, scientists watched psilocybin rewiring the brain. And that phrase, rewiring the brain, it's so powerful, it makes you picture, I don't know, synapses physically building themselves live on a screen. It does. It's a very vivid image. But before we just run with the hype, we have to stop and ask the real question here. Did they really watch it happen live in real time? Or is this, you know, another case of the science getting a little lost in the headline? And that is uh, the crucial distinction we need to make. Because while that viral claim is, let's say, a bit misleading. A bit, yeah. The science underneath it, the discoveries about real structural and, and functional neuroplasticity mm-hmm. are, and I'm not exaggerating here, they're forcing us to completely rethink how the adult brain can change, how it can heal. And that's our mission today. We're going to unpack three huge studies. We're going to go from the microscopic level, the actual creation of physical connections, all the way up to these massive shifts in whole brain networks. All to get this idea of a temporary reset window. A window, an opportunity for the brain to escape its old loops. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe if you enjoy content that makes you think. So we're here to give you the science behind that reset, to separate the hype from what's actually happening in the brain. Okay, so let's set the stage. To really get why this is so revolutionary, we first have to understand the problem. I mean, Why would a brain need rewiring at all? We used to talk about a chemical imbalance. Right. For decades, that was the model. But this new research points to something else. It's not just chemistry. It's it's about the brain's structure getting stuck. It's about rigidity. And the main player here is a network called the Default Mode Network, or the DMN. DMN. Think of it like the brain's screensaver, or its idle mode. It's what's running when you're not focused on a task, Mm. when you're just you know, daydreaming or thinking about yourself. So it's where your inner monologue lives. Exactly. It's where your sense of self resides, where you process memories. It's not a bad thing. We need it. Mm -hmm. But in things like severe depression or anxiety or even addiction, that network becomes, well, it becomes hyper-connected. It gets overtrained, stuck in these really rigid self-referential feedback loops. So instead of helping you reflect, it just becomes an engine for for rumination, the same negative thoughts over and over. Precisely. It's like you said, it gets stuck. I was thinking of an analogy, like, the brain isn't broken, but the pathways have become too efficient, too deep, like driving a car on the same dirt road every day until the ruts are so deep, you literally can't steer off that path. That is the perfect way to visualize it. That neurological rut is the over-reinforced circuitry. And what psilocybin seem to do is temporarily pave over those ruts. So you have a moment to choose a new path. A moment where the brain can actually forge a new route, a new pattern of thinking. Okay, so this brings us back to that phrase, rewiring. When the media grabbed onto that, they made it sound like an instant observable event. And we really have to be clear here. The idea that researchers were watching new synapses snap together live in a human under a microscope That is an oversimplification. It's not what happened. Not at all. The studies were revolutionary, but they used time-delayed measurements. They were either tracking functional shifts, so how brain regions talk to each other, or they were taking structural snapshots. Hours or days apart. Right. Comparing the brain before the dose to the brain well after the experience was over. So we're not talking about a movie. We're talking about incredibly detailed before and after photos. That's a great way to put it before and after photos that let you infer the massive reorganization that happened in between. The 2025 cell study, for instance, they did their imaging a week after the dose. The Yale study from 2021 was more like a time lapse, checking in over several days. Which is so important because it means the environment during and after matters. The drug opens the door, but something else guides the actual reconstruction. Exactly. The context is everything. Okay, so let's go down to that microscopic level, the proof of physical change. The 2021 Yale study in mice is where this idea of structural plasticity really got its legs. What did they actually see? So they were looking at neurons in the frontal cortex using this incredible technology, two-photon laser scanning microscopy. It lets them see the physical structure of living neurons in mice. And what part of the neuron's architecture were they focused on? They were looking at the dendritic spines. The spines? Yeah, so if the neuron is a tree, the dendrites are the branches, and the spines are the tiny little leaves on those branches. 
They're the physical points of contact that receive signals from other neurons. They are the connections. Okay, so the spines are the infrastructure. What happened to that infrastructure after just one dose of psilocybin? It was. It was rapid structural plasticity. Within just 24 hours of that single dose, the mice showed about a 10% increase in both the number and the size of these dendritic spines. 10%. I mean, that sounds like a lot, but is the brain not always making new connections? It is, but this was different. Daily changes are usually pretty subtle. A little bit of growth here, a little pruning there. A 10% increase, system-wide, and that fast. That's like a major sudden construction project getting underway. A neurological building boom. Right. And here's the really incredible part. These new spines stuck around. They're still there at least one month later. A whole month. So the new infrastructure, the new potential pathways for healthier thoughts, they didn't just appear and then vanish. They became a lasting part of the brain's architecture. Exactly. And they connected it to behavior too. Stressed mice that got the dose showed real improvements in their coping skills. And that improvement correlated directly with that increased spine density. It was a physical basis for self-repair. Okay, that's the cellular foundation. Incredible. Now let's zoom out. From a single cell to the whole brain. This brings us to the big 2025 cell study, the one that showed how these huge circuits can shift from, from looping inward to engaging outward. This really was the oh wow moment for mapping these big circuit changes. But to do it, they needed a very specialized tool. Right, and this is the one that involves a modified rabies virus, which I have to admit sounds a little alarming. It sounds like science fiction, doesn't it? <laughs> but it's fascinating. They use an engineered disabled rabies virus. And what's special about this virus is that it can travel across a synapse from one neuron to the next and leaves behind a little fluorescent marker. It's like a tracer. It's a biological tracer, yeah. So they could inject it into certain neurons after the psilocybin dose, wait a week, and then literally see which connections were stronger, which were weaker, and which new roads have been built compared to control mice. So the psilocybin basically loosens up the old roadmap, and the virus is like a die that shows you where all the new roads went. What did that tracer reveal? It revealed two massive things. First, psilocybin weakened recurrent excitatory connections within the cortex. Okay, break that down. Those are the tight internal feedback loops. That's the physical reality of your deep rut analogy. It's the constant ping-ponging of signals that drives rumination. Psilocybin basically made those old roads less traveled. So it literally turns the volume down on that inner loop of self-criticism. Okay, what was the second finding? At the same time, it strengthened pathways from sensory cortices to subcortical regions. So from the parts of the brain that see and hear and feel, to the parts that act. Precisely. The brain was shifting its resources. Instead of looping on itself, it was strengthening the connections that process the outside world and translate that information into action, into engaging with the environment. That is a profound shift. It's moving from introspection to engagement. And it also really suggests that the rewiring was, what's the term, activity dependent. Absolutely critical point. The context, the environment, the therapy, what you do during that window of plasticity seems to guide where the new construction happens. Mm -hmm. The psilocybin clears the ground, but your experience lays the new foundation. If you feel your own brain circuits loosening up from all this, now is a great time to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss the next deep dive. Okay, we've done cells and circuits in mice. We have to bring this into the human brain. And that takes us to the 2024 Nature fMRI study. This was incredibly detailed work, just seven people, but they were scanned multiple times over three weeks to see these network changes at an individual level. And what did they see right after the dose? What happens to the networks? Acutely, right after the dose, they saw massive, widespread network desynchronization. Desynchronization? Yeah, think of your brain networks as a perfectly choreographed orchestra playing the same symphony every day. Desynchronization is like the conductor just walks off stage and every musician starts playing whatever they want. Functional connectivity just plummeted across the cortex. So the rigid pattern is literally dissolved for a moment. That's the reset visualized. But did that chaos lead to any lasting positive change? It did. The key long-term finding was a persistent decrease in connectivity between the hippocampus and the DMN. And this lasted for weeks. This is the rewiring you can actually measure in humans. And why is that specific connection hippocampus to DMN so important? Well, the hippocampus is crucial for memory and context. Mm -hmm. By uncoupling it from that overactive DMN, you're essentially breaking the link between your rigid sense of self and the old memories that reinforce it. 
it creates a space for sustained cognitive flexibility that just wasn't there before. Okay, that ties it all together. So zooming out, what does this all mean for us? for the listener. It's not a magic cure. It's something maybe more important. It's an opportunity. That's the whole concept of the window of enhanced neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm. Psilocybin is a catalyst. It reduces the brain's inertia, making it more flexible, more editable for a period of weeks. And because that rewiring is activity dependent, the drug is just the first step. It provides the potential. But the patient, the therapist, the environment, they provide the direction. During that open window, things like therapy and intentional practice. That's what helps the brain solidify those healthier new patterns into its new flexible structure. It's a totally different model of treatment. It really is. It shifts the focus from chronic management to acute intensive integration. But with a tool this powerful, we have to ground this in some serious caveats. Absolutely. This research is exciting, okay. but it all happens in highly controlled clinical settings. It's critical to state that psilocybin is an absolute contraindication for anyone with a history of psychotic disorders. Because of the risk of psychosis. A very real and significant risk. Unregulated use is dangerous, and frankly, it undermines the careful scientific work being done to understand these compounds safely. Right. So assuming a safe clinical framework, where does this research go next? What's the future look like? Well, the future is moving toward ultra-precision medicine. First, mapping an individual's unique brain networks to personalize the treatment, to see which circuits need that reset the most. And second, the combination of psychedelics with neuromodulation, hmm. using tools like TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, to literally actively steer that plasticity into the circuits where you want it to go. Wow, so you could pinpoint the change. Potentially. And the other big frontier is developing what are called non-hallucinogenic analogs. Compounds that create the plasticity without the trip. Exactly. If you can get the reset without the intense psychedelic journey, it could take these treatments accessible to so many more people. We started this deep dive with that viral claim, you know, scientists watching a brain rewire itself in real time. And we end with something I think much more profound. We were watching neuroscience prove that the brain was never as fixed as we thought it was. That's it. The evidence from the spines to the circuits to the human fMRI scans it all points to the same thing. The brain has this incredible innate capacity to reset and repair itself. Remember, every deep dive is about sparking curiosity, challenging assumptions, and expanding understanding. We really hope this exploration of the editable brain has done that for you. And please like, comment, and subscribe to hear more My Mind Mashups deep dives. You can find My Mind Mashups everywhere you listen. Amazon Music, Audible, Facebook, Pocket Cast, Spotify, TikTok, and YouTube. And as you think about all this, this idea that the brain can be made temporarily editable, I want to leave you with one final thought to chew on. If the old circuits can be loosened and new ones written in, who decides what gets written? Who decides what new self is constructed during that open window? Drop your thoughts in the comments. Your perspective could shape our next deep dive.